was lucky that I grew up in uh, an artistic family. I had a very much a, a, an art background. And it was just there in mm. the corner of my eye as I was growing up. But I was, I was a bit different from my folks and I got interested in science and maths and all that other stuff at school. It did take me a long time to, to realise that the stuff I was interested in as a kid, that I became interested in as a kid, mm. of patterns and shapes and geometry and decoration through repetition, things like that. I'm interested in the sort of the thought process that, that happened before before you go down that route. I studied in Manchester, uh, then in Oxford Brooks. Uh, in Manchester's where I met my business partner. And uh, I didn't know that at the time. But, uh, uh, and then from, from Oxford Brooks, I got to the opportunity to study in the USA. And I got to see different types of architecture, so I got to see uh, conservation practices. To do some really great projects, including uh, an invisible tensegrity structure. I loved it. And I got to get the teas. <laughs> um, and that got me to Venice Biennale, and I got to put this, because I was the only person who knew how this model, it was like a, a large scale model. So I, I made this, this, this model, and because I was the only person who could reassemble it, I had to go to Venice with it, went there from there to Herbic Studio. So I did eight and a bit years with, uh, with that company. So that was, that was again a really fascinating time because I got to see, this, because Tom Sedgwick doesn't come from a, an architecture background, he comes from a 3D design background. Architecture isn't just that or just that, it is a spectrum of things. So it is how you think about the world as architecture. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an approach rather than being a label. And, um, and that I think is a really useful uh, thing to bear in mind, that you, you, there's, no, there's no prototypical architect. There's no, no person you can point to to say, that, that's an architect. That's not an architect, that is an architect. It's, it's everybody who's involved in, in building things, in thinking about how to prepare to build things, that's all part of architecture. So we get to work on all sorts of different things because we're very small, um, we're, but it means we're very agile. So we get to work on buildings, and we get to work on, so we just, we've just refurbished the National, uh, the National Opera Studio. We get to work on artworks, so today I presented our artwork based on Marcel Duchamp's mm -hmm. fountain urinal. Um, and we get to work on large-scale artwork for the public realm in a city a northern city in England. Uh, basically, what, what happens is eventually you you find out what, what it is that you're good at and what you enjoy and what, what marks you out as different from other people. But you only find that out through trying various things and through you know, doing doing better. And maybe you, maybe you find your more tenacious than other people at certain, uh, certain activities. Tenacity, the need for tenacity. If you, 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 when you, your first idea will be derivative. It will be lots of people will have had that first idea the same as you. And but keep going, keep going. We'll get somewhere that no one else has got that tenacity. Which even if you're not you know, the best person to do, doing that particular. Job. If you can stick with it, and if you can, if you've got the, the determination, you can get to somewhere that that talented person couldn't be bothered to. Yeah. I think I'm almost about to say a wise word, but it's not happening. <laughs> well, I think everything you just said is so wise. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. We didn't. We, well, we, we knew we knew each other, and we knew that we had different skills, and we knew we had different outlooks. So there is a we knew there was that necessary uh, difference between us, so we're not we're not we're not we're not fired up by the same things, which mean, which is useful because you need to have dialogue in your design and business as well. And so to get to have good dialogue, it helps if you've got different opinions and you've been inspired by different things. So when we talk about what we do. Uh, Oh, you know, one of us will say, this is brilliant because of, because of this, it's got all this. And the other one will say, but what about that? Why haven't you put any of that in it? And the, by 
we, 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 we plug the gaps in each other's arguments. And, um, you know, when one of us is stuck, then the other one will have another angle. So, it's something you work out every day. It's like you've made some sort of breakthrough and you're like, actually, you know what, that, that idea you had, the reason I got annoyed about it was it's a really good idea. That was the that was a, a, a that was a tricky project. So that was a, a, a large uh, development in People's People's Republic of China, and the brief was that the this whole development was being themed around the world. And here is the European zone. You don't have a site, so we didn't know if there was a slope or if it was a what sort of road it was on or anything. So it was just. Just make a, a, a box this big, and it's going to have three layers. Yeah. We're going to find some traditional building methods. We're going to find some colours, and we're going to smash them together, and kind of so, to make a, 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 a formula for making these designs. Because you've got this formula, you can sidestep the cliches mm. and just get into the, the these things which are evocative of a country. Because it's impossible. You can't. How do you summarise a country in one building? It's very hard. So, um, I mean, I think my favourite of the, of the designs was the Swiss pavilion, which sort of combined this incredibly rough texture of Swiss mountains and then the precision of Swiss engineering in the things like window reveals, which are all absolutely crisp edges. No, we, 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 we see each project as being unique, so it, is, it is unique, but um, we, we don't have a, a, a pattern book that we apply, so lots of, lots of architects have a style which makes life a lot easier because you just say, okay, well, that's what we're doing, we're obviously going to do something like this, it's going to be a blue box, whatever we design, that's what it's going to end up, or maybe it's going to be a green box, but it's always going to be a box. I love natural forms where you can, you, you can create something that looks like it's a complex organic shape but you, do you produce it in an effortless repetitive shape. There's been a, it's also a little bit of a kick against, there's a lot of architecture around which is making complex forms through complex processes and that is like, that seems, that's too much work. But we, we wanted something that was memorable. Uh, it was short, but there wasn't an acronym. Um, there's this really strange when you can, you can look at a list of names for architecture companies, and with, even before you know anything about them, you, you, you have prejudices. Your prejudices seep in. So if you see a three-letter acronym, you know it's a corporate firm. And if it's a two-name, if it's something and something, then you you. you you again have an, an image, especially if it's two men, of like, oh, that's what they are. If it's one name, you think, okay, there's no terror. And we didn't want to be any of those, so we went for this sort of the most neutral name we could so that it, it was flexible to allow us to do the maximum number of projects. So if we are doing a bit, a bit of work which involves branding, we can still be boosted here. If we're doing a piece of architecture, we can be boosted here. So it, it has that flexibility that we need so that when we present ourselves as well, education, we do a lot of work in education. Exactly that, development develop and, and putting time into process. So, and, and not just going with your first instinct. So you, 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 you make a mistake, and you make another mistake, and you learn from those mistakes, and you feed back into that process. So with the, the sculpture based on the arrival, we did a lot of sketching, and you learn, from the sketching you think, you, 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 you draw your first idea and it's rubbish, you think, actually, no, that didn't work. But then that gives you another idea. And then you think, actually, that's, that's pretty good, but it needs to be smoother. Oh, but now it's, it's, too, it's too complicated, mm -hmm. so sim simplify it down. And, um, and simplify that, and it'll work, and it's made that work, and it's work. And then when you've, you've exhausted what your pen can do, and what your brain can, and pen can do together, then you change medium. The computer, then when you've explored what you can in the computer land, you come back into the physical world and okay, start making some little prototypes. And that, that process is the only way we know of making things. There's a, there's a problem that when people think about design, 
it looks like it's a, it's a straight path because that's the story you tell afterwards. But what you don't realise is that that straight line is actually that it's like a it's like a tree, and you're a little caterpillar, and you've you've, you've had to explore all these branches on the tree. And sometimes you get on a dead end, and sometimes you have to go that way to get the spot. And eventually, you get to some fruit on the end of the branch. Um, and you tell someone about what you did, you don't show them this this crazy uh, path and all these crap ideas you came up with, that, or even the ones you, you oh, yeah, that's quite good, I'll have you save that for later. Um, you, you take that, that path and you, you smooth it out, and you just say, okay, there's this simple, yeah, this leads to that, this, this leads to that, what could, what could be more straightforward? The key is to change medium. That's the best thing to do. So if, do, do the things, file them, keep them on file, um, put them in an order. So the, the first step in our process is to have a conversation. And that might be, you might have a dialogue. In, in, if you're a student, you might have a dialogue with one of your fellow students, a tutor, with one of your end users. Um, and then writing up that dialogue and mapping the dialogue if you get stuck, which you will do, it's changing mediums very good. So go from drawing to computers, computers to drawing, computers to clay. And oh, it's also important to do something else as well. So you, you, you're not just thinking about your problem. I really recommend the, the talk by Grayson Perry about, about you know, the Reith lecture about creativity, his creative process. There's also a good one by Charlie Kaufman, who wrote it down. Sunshine, sunshine, sunshine. He does a very good one for laughter. And John Cleese does a good one about creativity, where he talks about the open and closed modes of creative work, where in the open mode you're just throwing ideas around and anything goes and it's all very freewheeling. And then the closed mode is right, we're going to take that idea and we're going to make it work and we're going to make it work from top to bottom. Sometimes, you know, it can be having a, a day job, so if you've got a part-time job, that's a good way of helping your, your subconscious thing. So actually, I'm going to go and do this for five hours. But as, at the end of it, you'll be, you'll be like, oh, I need to get back to my work. And there'll be, urgent, there'll be an urgency that you didn't have if you just had time. Uh, when you run out of money or time, usually, uh, that's the main one. <laughs> With, with the, the Heatherwick days, we would, we would always, it's, it's an oscillation thing, so you, 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 it, it, it gets, it's very jerky at first and then it smooths out and you end up with, with, with the idea over here. And most architects sort of veer around a little bit and then it settles down quite quickly. Um, people like when I was with Heatherwick, it, was, it went on a bit longer, so we like, it's nearly right, it's nearly right, yeah, we need to tweak it more, and it went through a couple more tweaks. There's your first idea, there's the perfection. And you sort of in the first, in the first half, as time goes on, you know you get halfway there, and then you get another halfway there, and you get another halfway there, and then you get another halfway there. So you, you never really get to perfection, but it's just how many jumps are you prepared to make? It's hard. something that doesn't get taught much anymore, which is formal descriptive geometry. And I don't know if you do that, but basically it's doing on paper 
with different views. So if you use something like Rhino, you know, you Rhino, you have different viewports. You see it from the side, from the top. You do work it that way, but on paper. And you're defining and describing different forms, and then you're performing geometric operations. So for example, if you take a cylinder and you skew it, and then you intersect it with a sphere, like what does the intersection look like? How do you compute that by hand? And that, together with um, geometric calculus, uh, is something that gave me a notion that you could actually control space and control form in a certain way. Um, and then finally, I think it was um, actually, to some extent, um, watching my mother, who is not an architect. I always, I always told her she was the greatest architect that never was, because she used to tinker a lot in, in, in a house she has in Italy and build things and build walls and get people to do stuff in addition. So I was always around building sites of people doing stuff and working with quite traditional materials. That, and then as I mentioned, you know, as a child, spending a lot of time in places like Saturn's airport terminals because we traveled through there family all the time. Um, all those things combined, I think, kind of just generated an interest, I think, that to pursue the field. Um, I think it's a little bit like in any form of expressive art, if you like, especially because architecture is somewhere between art and engineering. You know, if you study in Germany, you become a diploma engineer. Who happens to be an architect. And in this country, perhaps it's more still on the design side. But I think whatever you develop, whatever you design, it's good to be able to, in some cases, you know, think freely and kind of look for new ideas. But at the same time, I think you always have to think in the back of your mind, have a responsibility towards your design about how you might go about looking for a way to execute it. It doesn't mean you have all the answers or, you, you know, you immediately know where to get all the answers, but you should be aware that ultimately, as a professional, you'd like to see your work achieved and realized. And to do that, um, you have to understand that there is a process beyond the initial thinking that uh, has to do with how a project gets built, how it gets financed, and how it turns into something real. So if you have that in the back of your mind when you're designing, you can be more critical of your own design. And sometimes you want to use that more, and sometimes you want to use that less. But in my view, uh, it's a little bit like if you think of, I don't know, Mozart. I mean, Mozart thinks of a beautiful melody in his mind. But he has to be, you know, he's thinking about it, but he's thinking about how he's going to write it down, and who's going to perform what part, and this is going to be the violins, and that's the cellos, and that's the double bass, and these are the woodwinds, and so on. There's an orchestration that goes around. You have to be able to understand both, because ultimately it's how that music is going to be expressed. Otherwise, it just remains a tune in its mind, and it never see the light of day. You see what I mean? So you have to, as you go through becoming older and uh, having gray hairs like me, and uh, you know, you 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 start becoming more aware of the breadth and range of the disciplines that you need to understand. Doesn't mean you're going to be good at all of them. You know, some people are better at the initial design. Some people. Are very good at marshalling those initial design ideas. Some people are good at constantly working with designers, thinking about how to build them, which is kind of where I spend most of my time. Uh, other people are, you know, they just do a lot of management. You know, they do contracts management, they do business management, all different parts of, of the practice and the work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, in a certain sense, you find your niche. You know, if you run a one man practice, you have to do a little bit of everything. Um, if you're working on larger projects, um, then you find your, your form of expression in a particular type of project typology. Well, I mean, you know, the higher you climb, the longer you fall, and the louder the thud when you hit the ground. So, you know, for her, I think it was quite difficult because, from a number of points of view, she was a woman. She was not from England. She was a Muslim from. Arabic country. She did very unconventional work and she spoke her mind. So that doesn't exactly make her own life easy. Um, I think you can take different points of view. If you, if you have criticism, if it's a constructive criticism, you can absorb it intelligently. A lot of criticisms that you can receive is not constructive or it's because people are, you know, can be not agreeing with what you're doing or they're jealous or somehow don't really 
want to have a constructive discussion. And so that kind of criticism, you have to know when it's just not worth bothering with and ignoring. Uh, you should be aware of it, uh, but I think you should be aware of what is actually real constructive criticism or critique or questions and help you, in a way, uh, reflect on the work that you're doing and how you're working. And uh, perhaps you learn something from it, you know, because we never stop learning. Um, but, you know, it's, it's in any field, it's easy to criticize. Criticizing is always easy to do, particularly in a negative way. To be providing a constructive form of comment is more difficult than the person doing it, but it's also much more useful for the person receiving it. My name is Guan Li. I am a lecturer in the Bombay School of Architecture and also at the RCA. And I run a practice uh, called Grim Style Forum in Buckinghamshire. So, Grim Grim Style Forum. What 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 inspired you to give this name? Well, it's not a name that I've given it. It's a name of the property. Grim Style Forum is a farm uh, in a small village called Lacey Green and uh, it was a running a, a fully operating farm in the 19 up until the 19th century and then it was divided up into uh, small parts. What kind of things take place on your farm? Um, all kinds of things. <laughs> we, uh, we run uh, workshops for students um, on um, all kinds of architecture related uh, making of prototypes. What, what made you get into architecture? What is it about architecture that attracted you? Um, I guess my dad was a contractor and I've always been kind of surrounded by in the building trades. The architect was always the boss. I wanted to be the boss. <laughs> But little did I know, actually, the architect is not the boss. So, so share with us, in your perception, who is the boss? Well... Besides the client? I hate to say this, but, uh, you know, uh, in a way, the boss is uh, economy. Economy is the boss. What, what advice would you like to give to young students or students of architecture? wanting to be a part of this industry. Follow whatever you do whatever you are passionate about. Yes, I think. Yeah. And uh, because architecture it's a uh, even though we don't build every single part of the building, especially in large scale buildings, it's still very a very, very intimate uh, process. I've seen in your sculptures and the things that you do a lot of organic shapes, but and, and then you do you use like a lot of geometric and uh, angular style. Is there a way you could describe your style? Style. Yeah, like uh, everybody talks about design philosophy or your design style. How would you describe your own? Um, my my design philosophy is that I I sort of mentioned. Uh, Presentation that is to do with uh, people, processes of making, and a place. So these are key elements that I like to work with. And, and in, in our architecture, it's a combination of these various parties. You know. It's not really a style as such as formal style, but it's, all, it's important. It's important to take into consideration all these these three. Um, Elements for me, you know, people, processes, material, and then the place itself. No, and I feel like though uh, a lot of the things that you did and just how you spoke about it is that you thought about. Did you think about sustainability, or do you try to integrate uh, sustainability in your designs? Um, I didn't talk about it, but it's always in at the back of my mind because for me, sustainability it's not an important buzzword. 
I don't use it as a word to talk about my work because it's something inherent in what what we all should do, and it's inherent in the action. So I tend not to talk about it because, first of all, it's a very difficult subject to to claim that you are doing. So I rather talk about things that I, I have more control over, or not some control, but more influences over. You know, and uh, sustainability is our responsibility. So yes. But it's not something. It's not a word that I I like to use lightly.